True Story is a documentary podcast powered by the Institute of Documentary Film. You can find news from the world of film on all the common platforms such as iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, as well as on docweb.net. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kimberly Diltz, and I am thrilled to be moderating this conversation with um, three extraordinary documentary filmmakers. Um, I'm joined today by Jamie Jacobson, the director of Finding Traction and The Last Artifact, Kira Ackerman, the director of Hollow Tree, and Drew Xanthopoulos, director of Fathom and The Sensitives. And I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get started. First of all, for the audience, um, we're not we're gonna skip the extended uh, introduction so that we can really get to the questions. But please look up these filmmakers and their work. Um, you will not be sorry. Their work is extraordinary. <laughs> um, so I want to start. Our our conversation is entitled "Between Art and Science: Courage in Documentary Filmmaking." So I want to know for you. Um, when you think of that theme, so what does courage mean to you in the context of the process of making documentary films? I'm happy to start. Um, I actually uh, just took, I took some notes. So let me know if uh, I'm just gonna read some of the, what came to mind when I was thinking about that question. Um, and I was thinking about it particularly as related to my, feature film, Hollow Tree, um, and thinking about confronting grief and fear as a form of courage. Um, I think it's frightening to ask audiences to look uh, squarely at something that they're desperately trying to avoid. Um, and this plays out in my film in a variety of ways, uh, in the portrayal of climate change and in my portrayal of science. Um, and it's not, it's not comfortable for people to accept climate change as connected to slavery. Um, it's not comfortable for people to see science as entangled with history and politics. Um, and people want to see science as presented as objective and outside of human values and political motives. Um, and I was told by um, one of the programmers at AFO that the science in my film was paradigm shifting and and it was not even like it wasn't up for a prize for that reason um and it seems like lots of people want science to be stable and not open for debate or interpretation um least of all from the young women of color featured in my film so when i when i look squarely at the environment i live in and and film in i see the way science has been used to rationalize the destruction of the wetlands and the people who live there. And I don't think that means that science itself is bad. It's not good or bad. It's a human endeavor. So it's complicated in the way all human things are. And um, that there's grief in acknowledging that sometimes human actions are unfixable and being with avoiding it um, is a form of courage. Beautiful. Jamie, Drew, anything to add? Sure, yeah. Um, I love this question because I feel like courage is such a um, nuanced uh, term, so to speak. There's so many different ways to um, think about it, and especially when applied to filmmaking. So one of the things that came to mind was this idea of, you know, I was both thinking about my own process as a documentary filmmaker and also the people whose stories that I'm collaborating with, who I'm trying to, you know, bring to light, bring to the screen, so to speak. And this idea of taking creative risks 
came to mind and how courageous it is when um, you see people doing that in their real lives and that as a storyteller, as an artist, as a filmmaker, I'm also doing that with, within the confines of the stories I'm telling. Um, so I faced this recently. Um, I, I've done a lot of feature documentaries, Finding Traction and Last Artifact, as you mentioned, and I've been working on a short film, only five minutes. It's a poetic documentary film. So it's a bit of a um, new uh, genre for me in that it's so short and concise. Um, and this particular project is called Behind, uh, Beyond the Soil that I'm working on. And um, it looks at the emotional impact um, kind of piggybacking off of Kira and her work of climate change um, in the Rocky Mountain West on farmers and ranchers, and also their innovation and resilience in light of ecological crisis. So thinking about the creative risks they're taking every day, you know, on their farms, on their ranches to keep producing food in such, you know, challenging conditions. And then how can we um, bring some of that courage to the screen by taking creative risks ourselves as filmmakers? And one of the things that we did in this project was um, we decided to include kind of handheld, unstable footage where we follow, you know, we start with some of the farmers and ranchers in these more tranquil, serene environments in their homes. And we go out into the, you know, kind of uh, tough environments that they're dealing with here where we have a mega drought in Colorado and the U.S. right now. So that's um, a real rather extreme situation and just feeling kind of having them cropped to the edge of the frame, feeling, you know, sort of trapped and dealing with this um, discomfort and uncertainty and unpredictability of the environment. So we tried to mimic that in some of the camera work that instead of cutting it out of the edit, we chose deliberately to leave it in. And I think it's a little bit risky because at its worst, it might come off as a mistake. Like, why did you include this shaky footage in your film, you know? Um, but we thought we wanted to try and create a visceral experience for the audience where they might get a little bit closer to the emotional landscape that the farmers and ranchers that we were filming, you know, confront and are embedded in every day. So if you like, I can try and um, play a short, about a minute long clip from the film. It's, it's not released yet. It's coming out soon to the festival circuits this year. Um, so I'll try and share my screen and play that so you can see an example of moving from the serene, calm indoor environment into a more unstable outdoor environment reflecting the changing climate. One of the first books that I read about soil health was uh, David Montgomery's Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations. And that just drove home, you know, every single major superpower in the history of mankind has died off. And you can tie it to what happened in their soil. And I look at what's going on in the United States and around the world right now, and if we don't do something, we're not gonna have soil to farm. And if that's the case, we're not gonna be able to produce food. And, you know, that's, that's the foundation of civilization. Years like this, they're gonna tear people down. It just emotionally drains you and you have no recharge. What can we actually make work in this climate? Surprisingly enough, we're finding we can make more things work than we thought. You know, this year we're raising 14 crops and they're not the pretty, pristine fields. They're not the normal crops that everybody sees. But they work, they're profitable. They're helping the farm to not just survive, but actually thrive. spend your entire life mastering a profession. And the two things that are most critically important in agriculture that are going to be the difference between feeding your family and having your family starve. That was great. <laughs> so 
I hope that helps illustrate a little bit of what we tried to do, you know, cinematically to um, take creative risks in our production process and, and some of the risks that the producers that we are collaborating with take in their yeah. Own and you know, Jamie, it's also really like it's really emotional footage, I feel like. Um, and so I wonder, um, you know, Kira, you were mentioning this, too, that, you know, being a documentarian in 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 the natural world right now has weight to it, right? Has real emotional weight. And it doesn't even matter if, you know, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis touches everything. So it doesn't matter if that's your subject, it's going to touch you in some way. And so I wonder um, if um, any of you have thoughts about, you know, as a documentarian, how do you care for yourself while you are documenting this very weighty work? Yes, I should should say something at some point. Uh, <clears throat> I um, I, I mean, I think that it sounds like for uh, Jamie and Kira's work, also you're kind of like when you're making a documentary film, you're in tandem with the subject of the film, and they're obviously they've been living with this stuff for a long time, um, and uh, and in some ways they're saturated with it in a way that most of us aren't especially scientists um or not, not, was he a scientist jamie or is he a, a strictly an agriculturalist agriculturalist although yeah. he's got multiple degrees a bit of a renaissance man if you will even better so like anyway they're both like steep like eyeball deep in in the reality of how this affects them really directly or it's it feels like a lot of us, um, it's a little more indirect, I guess, in our day-to-day -day lives um, for a lot of the work we do. So for me, I mean, personally speaking, it's, um, you know, you're in sync with the emotion out, with the emotional experience of your subjects and they're very much being affected. In my case, it's, you know, scientists who are studying um, whales and their communication and culture. And so, um, yeah, as much as a lot of other scientists are at the forefront of really seeing the impacts um, year to year, season to season to season um, on their subjects. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of like how to keep it from, you know, being debilitating or, you know, as a, emotionally as a filmmaker, you really are taking on your subject's emotions um, as the filmmaker trying to um, synchronize with them in that way. Uh, I think it's similar to kind of what I've seen my scientists do in terms in, in the film that I made, which is um, you really have, have to also appreciate what what is in front of you and have a kind of veneration of, of what is here right now and, and, and how it's persisting despite all the obstacles as well. It's this like kind of like delicate balance between being able to appreciate um, something that may be in even in decline but there it is in front of you and how fortunate that is um, to be able to witness that and kind of translate that energy into the work in a way that um, might help um, solve some of the stems of the problems that we're living through yeah here at jamie anything to add any thoughts I just thought of a movie I'm inspired by that uh, I think that was one of the prompts you sent us and um, Kristen Johnson's camera person is so much about being a camera person, being behind the camera, being the documentarian and the way that you carry through imbibing and um, vibing other stories and being present for them and how they become part of you in your own existence. And um, so I, I just throwing that in as if you haven't seen it, it's a, I think it's a, a really beautiful movie. I really love that reference, uh, Kira. It's a gorgeous film. And I think um, what you said, you really nailed it on the, on the head and that you, take on the experiences of the people that you're collaborating with and working with and telling these stories. And for me, at least with this last project that I just mentioned, Beyond the Soil, I actually found it very challenging in some ways. Um, it, it got under my skin in a way that some other stories haven't. Um, 
and, you know, reliving, like being in the field with them and then reliving these moments and this testimony and even, you know, tears that we had and shared over and over and over in that edit, um, it, it can be incredibly difficult. Um, but I think the idea of storytelling and communicating important ideas that need to be shared with the public is something that really motivates me that I feel like, you know, I'm, I have agency, I'm doing something, you know, I'm, I'm hopefully creating something that um, is thought provoking and generates conversation. And, um, you know, the, I guess that in, in some ways that helps me, like that sense of purpose helps me deal with the weight of the process in that I feel like I have this goal that I'm working to a reason why I'm doing it and it's difficult and it's hard and it's emotional and it can be excruciating at times, but there's a bigger why behind it. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking a lot about, um, the concept that if you can't see a thing, if you can't imagine a thing, you can't make it, you can't make it real. Right. And so, um, I think, I think a lot about the, the vision I have for the future. And I think that's documentarians, you know, to some extent are doing that as well, you know, showing either showing the now so we can imagine a better future or, you know, trying to help people imagine forward into a better future. So I, I'm, I'm going to pivot this a little bit. I, I'm thinking about, you know, <laughs> filmmaking uh, can be a really challenging process. Um, so, you know, there's, there's courage involved in, you know, obviously facing um, your subject matter, but also, just getting the thing done, right? And the three of you have, um, you know, made films that have made it all the way through the gauntlet, um, you know, to to reach wide audiences. And I'm wondering, you know, what are what are some of the challenges? You know, some of our audience are, are budding filmmakers. So, what are some of the challenges that you have faced? What's your, what's the what's the the hardest challenge you faced? And, and how did you, uh, how did you get through it? Uh, I can, I can uh, speak to uh, some, some of that. I mean, other than all the um, natural disasters and crazy life changes of your subjects and um, uh, yeah, a really long pandemic that all of us have, you know, had to deal with and have to deal with. That last one is kind of unique, I guess, in our lifetimes. But um, other than all that, uh, which is kind of the usual, it's, I mean, that's the usual stuff. But doc, if it's not, honestly, I'm kind of a little tongue in cheek here, but if it's not uh, a huge pandemic, then it's like, you know, something really tragic happened in your subject or like, so their life changed. So like every, something's going to change your film, you know, dramatically at some point, if you're, if you stick around with someone long enough. But other than that, for I mean, my film had an interesting challenge in that I just started getting really interested in um, uh, the science of whale communication and cognition and culture and all these things, and it was like really science fictiony to me and and kind of just amazing. Um, and so when I approached, uh, when I kind of pitched it for the first time to one of my advisors, um, I was like, and it could just be me, like on a boat, and it'll cost like nothing it'll be like a few thousand dollars that's all i need to like live for you know a month or something with these people and it'll be like super cheap and, and my she is the person i was pitching it to she'd worked in on sort of the executive side of, of industry and so she understood what she would then go on to explain to me as being like um the good old boy school of like uh whale like megaphone charming megafauna films which is you know there are a lot of mansions on the pacific coast that were built on um shark week and like whale films like that just keep coming out one after the other after the other so it was that was the greatest challenge and she told me that really early on it's that you're competing with bbc's and national geographics with a, on a topic that is so established in this one specific way to audiences around the world and so how do you convince you know the stuff that you're looking for in early on like not only scientists but like funders and producers and other people you need to make the film that yours is not only gonna make it through all of that really scary large form stuff but um uh but also you know kind of 
make it and thrive and actually be seen by people and you know received however you want it to be received so that was the biggest um challenge for me and how i overcame it i don't know it's like the craziest thing it's like a surreal life experience i got very fortunate um and in some ways here's what i would say i'll just like summarize it in an um, anecdote um when i would approach scientists and tell them what i wanted to do which is focus on their research these are whale scientists by the way like they're no stranger to filmmakers and huge crews that come in with like helicopters and antarctica you know nat Geo, all these big names and but i was actually like i was asking them spending an hour or two on the phone like how do you can you explain your research to me can you oh and i have all these questions because it's fascinating they're doing like crazy stuff out there and it dawned on them that like i was actually interested in their work and not not necessarily the whales like I kept having to describe to like tell them like no 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 like you're my whale like like you're the one I actually want to film more than anything else um your reaction on the boat if something's happening um rather than the whale itself um as much as possible so that was really what ended up I think allowing me to make the film to be honest this game but trust of the scientists that for the first time in many of their cases were approached by a filmmaker that was interested in their work and their lives rather than just kind of wanting to use them for a permit to get really close to whales and get cool shots of those that they did some of that as you know also but I was mostly interested in them so to me it's like kind of getting sort of linking into the original premise of like courage or whatnot it's like you know having the courage to see an idea through and 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 even if your idea even if you're going after in my case like a really big you know, figuratively and literal subject, then um, if you have an approach that's, I shy away from saying it's not really original, like it's just sort of the right time, the right moment, I guess, um, uh, that there's reward there for you and people will open doors for you, especially if it comes from the heart. I think that's actually the most important thing. It's It's got to come, you got to be like in love with what you're trying to pursue and it's got to come from your heart and people feel that and they respond to it. Um, and I think in this case, it allowed me to cut through the pretty intimidating politics and hierarchies um, in that part of that faction of documentary. It's really beautiful. Um, Jamie, Kira, does anything come to mind for you? I'm sure you both have had one, <laughs> one great challenge. Obstacle? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I was just thinking there's so many challenges that I can, how can I pick? Um, uh, but I am going to speak to one that highlights the really incredible producers on my team, um, Monique Walton and Chachi Hauser. The, the film, somebody at the California Film Institute recently said that the film was a masterclass in ethical filmmaking. And what that meant and means to us and our practice is that we are always putting people first and that the director and producers were in agreement with that that it's not about getting like if we can get the best shot great but <laughs> if somebody's not okay or um we're going to prioritize the person and we're going to pay everybody and make sure that people are compensated and that their time is valued and um, put in a lot of time and um, emotional energy into to building trust with the the communities that we're working with and um, and really ca and caring and checking in and I I think that 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 certainly is all relationships do to you know it takes a toll to um, have that level of care and. Um, and I think, and, and it's not something that's acknowledged in our society. So, you know, regardless of filmmaking. So I just want to, uh, yeah, I think that's not the, the difficulty in having, raising the funds to do that in, in putting it, in saying like, hey, we're not going to deliver this as fast as you might want it because that's not how fast a human relationship works. Sorry, <laughs> you know, like really um, putting in that level of, uh, dedication on the producing and directing and to um, create a an environment that is caring of 
every person involved um, was was both an op was a huge obstacle and is one that and and the one that we're in continual practice of having to navigate and move through. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Re relationships are incredibly challenging. And um, one of maybe to build off of what both Drew and Kira have said, um, a challenge that I face specifically um, in making The Last Artifact, which is a feature documentary about a really difficult subject. So in this case, um, my challenge was really like, how do I tell a story about something that is very complex and perhaps dry and boring. Like, how do I make it fun and interesting? And in this case, uh, the film follows an unsung, uh, little known band of scientists who are metrologists, um, uh, who are working to um, redefine our international measurement uh, system and the kilogram, which is the last physical artifact that humans have used um, to measure things um, up until very recently. And so trying to figure out like how to tell a story um, about an inanimate object and make it interesting, like the kilogram, historically it's been a hunk of metal um, under you know bell jars in a vault underground outside of Paris. And you know, just trying to figure out how to deal with um, uh, you know, most of the people that could speak to the history of measurement and the kilogram and how they were trying to redefine it with a mathematical equation were some of the top, um, you know, physicists in the entire world who were used to talking to, you know, maybe five or 10 other people on the entire planet about their research. And so trying to boil that science down in, into a way that was accessible and engaging and interesting was just really, really hard. And I'm, I'm not a physicist by training, by background, like this, this is my husband's an engineer, for example, I was an art major in college. So this was just really a tremendous challenge to literally let wrap my brain around. And so we tried to break it down into visual metaphors to think about like, how can we, um, yeah, create visual metaphors that stand in for much larger um, things, whether they're scientific concepts, whether they're like literally machines or whether they're large philosophical ideas. So I thought I would share a clip um, that's actually towards the end of the last artifact where um, we tried to figure out um, one of the British scientists that we interviewed um, is talking about why he finds metrology to be so beautiful. And it allows you to examine things just closer and closer and closer with such detail to really see their perfection. And so we came up with this idea of using like an eye chart, you know, when you go to the eye doctor or the, um, you know, to get your eyes examined and having kind of those letters come into focus and allowing you to really see the world was, was the visual metaphor that we eventually landed on. And I can show you, I have about a 30 second clip here that we can pull up and play where you can see that you know, we filmed it in the studio and that was how we tried to bring that larger philosophical idea to light towards the end of the film. Some people think metrology is dull. They think it's some kind of accountancy that completely misses the point. Metrology is looking closer and closer at things, seeing their form more perfectly, seeing them more clearly in themselves and just appreciating the full wonder and beauty of the world we have around us. Jamie, that was great. And, you know, it actually segues really beautifully into um, my next question because, you know, it sounds like part of the process for this, the, the, for the last artifact was really starting with the audience, right? How do I reach my audience where they are? Um, and as documentarians, I feel like, we listen sometimes documentaries are we're just trying to entertain right there's nothing wrong with a documentary that is a blast but also you know we're trying to change minds which there's often some kind of change in the world that we are aiming for um even if it's just a change in perspective right so um and you know the relationship with the audience is also a vulnerable one right i mean you spend years of your life putting this thing together and you think it works, but at a certain point, you know, you just have to put it out there and see how it goes. Right. 
So I wonder if the three of you can talk a little bit about, you know, when I work with filmmakers, the first thing I ask them is, who is this for and what do you, what do you want them to come away with, right? So I wonder if you can talk about um, when you think about your audience, you know, is it a different process for each film? Because each film has a, you know, obviously a very different subject, maybe a different motivation behind it. Um, yeah, can you just talk a little bit about the way you think about your audience and your relationship to them? All right, fine. Um, I, uh, I, uh, it's a really good question, and I think that uh, it's never been more relevant given that, uh, especially I think in the United States, um, documentary film has never been more commercialized. There's never been more money available in film. There's never been more, uh, therefore, influence on kind of what the market wants or whatever. Um, there's a few things that come to mind when you brought up that question and kind of the premise of it. And um, I'm a big fan of Adam Curtis's documentaries. I encourage anyone to watch his stuff. It's free on YouTube. BBC puts out his stuff. It's like unbelievable. Anyway, um, I don't even agree with like a lot of the stuff necessarily that he says, but it's like incredible filmmaking. He's really courageous. And um, but he said in the interview something that I thought was interesting, um, which he he said he didn't think that art functioned well when it tried to tell us what to do, um, that it actually works best when it holds a mirror to us and shows us what we're doing right right now. And there's a and that's really hard to do because if you're doing that, if you're holding a mirror in the right way, it, it should be a little uncomfortable for people to, to watch and witness and see. Um, some of it's funny, you know, it can elicit laughter and some of it's really interesting, but ultimately I think at some point it should be a little uncomfortable. Um, and so in terms of how do you think about your audience with projects and stuff, um, I really try not to think about, because I think that's like such a, I'm not saying this is what you're implicating with your question, but I think that the danger with commercialization, the danger with there being money out there as a temptation to try and mold work in order to get that money, to get that funding, to make a Netflix special or whatever it is you're trying to do, is that you start making work that you think people want to see. And that, to me, is a death knell of documentary filmmaking, because then we're just part. Of I mean, I do think there's harm in making something that's just inadvertent like just trying to be entertainment I, I i just don't think that's where nonfiction should be i think there's a place for that and it's like i watch entertainment i'm wrong but like nonfiction, it's, it's i don't know i just i think that we should be um making work that's just that's true and true to what true to the experiences if you're making a barricade film of the people who are in your film i think that's kind of the only truth that you, it's really hard to deny. It's like, well, you may think otherwise, but this is their experience and how they're feeling about things. So here it is. How does it make you feel? We all exist in the same world. Um, so we kind of have to deal with it, uh, uh, you know, in some way. Um, so I kind of, I don't know, I, I, I think like not thinking about your audience is probably the best approach. I And, on, and I've had moments during the edit to like, totally confess where I've absolutely, I'm not like some, like I, I've absolutely thought about the audience and been like, oh shit, are people going to think about this or that? And I've had really lovely producers and wise producers who've said, and editors and funders who've said, don't worry about that. Like you should not be thinking about the audience or how they're going to feel about this or that. This is about um, uh, staying true to the subject and the subject matter. Um, the only place I think we're thinking about the audience is ethically required of a documentarian is how the people in your film m might be perceived in the way that you're editing it and the way that they've been shot and the way the whole, you know, the whole smoke and mirrors of filmmaking, how does that shape how an audience sees them? Um, like, for example, with the work that I've done with both of my films, um, it's really important to show vulnerable moments but maintain someone's dignity, you know, um, and that's a really fine balance. And and you are definitely omitting things. You're definitely uh, maybe embellishing certain things to find that balance of what that is, um, which gets into like the really really tricky business of of filmmaking and truth and all that. But um, yeah, those are my 
maybe slightly too strong opinions about some of that. So. I don't think too strong at all. I think there's so many different ways to think about it, right? You know, you can think about it um, from the perspective of, oh, I just want to make something that's liked, right? But you can also think about it from the perspective of, you know, I am making, you know, there are filmmakers who make advocacy films, right? And so when they're thinking about their audience, it's less about how they're going to receive, well, it is about how they're going to receive it, but it's also about what is the change I wish to see happen as a result of this mirror being held up, right? Um, so that's, you know, that's part of it too. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think, I think from a perspective of like, pure documentarian not thinking about like not letting whether or not someone is going to like your film yes totally agree i mean that's let the subject speak for itself i, I certainly you know i certainly agree with that um you're totally right by the way that distinction between advocacy film that is and that is totally a big part of documentary filmmaking so that is a very different approach to how to how to make work and the goals involved. Yeah. This is, I, I love what you said, Drew. It's so fascinating um, to just hear you speaking about, um, in some ways, sort of trying to step away from the audience. The audience, that concept isn't controlling the art that you're producing. And I, I really respect and admire that. Um, I, I think in my mind, I, I've often interpreted audience a little bit differently, and maybe that's good. It's a good point for discussion. Um, you know, in some ways, I use it as a motivating factor to think about, you know, what can documentary do in society, sort of the pedagogical role of, of documentary, if you will, in that films, I think, can transport people to um, know people, places, events, um, that they might not never come into contact with in their everyday lives, let's say. So one of the things that I've really tried to embrace as a filmmaker is this idea of films at their best being these emotional, very vis visceral um, pieces of art and communication that can help build bridges across communities and cultures. So that might be, you know, in the case of The Last Artifact, building bridges between the general public and scientists, or in the case of the other project that I shared today, um, Beyond the Soil, um, building bridges um, between rural communities and urban communities. Uh, that was something that we heard a lot um, when we went out and were working with ranchers and farmers in Colorado. Um, they spoke a lot about the political ideological divides that divide rural America with urban communities and how they thought one of the things we really needed was more human connection across these very different cultures and communities. And for me, you know, as a filmmaker, I thought, well, this is really an opportunity um, in this case to bring some of those rural voices um, to more urban environments where film festivals often happen and in academic spaces and things like that. Um, so in some ways, I, I feel like I'm really intimately thinking about audience at every stage of the process, but it's more thinking about how can I connect the people who might see my films to what I'm trying to share and show, um, not necessarily dictating the content, but wanting to have that like emotional human connection um, come out as a result. Um, I definitely considered the audience um, quite a bit in, I can't tell, is my internet connection breaking up or is it okay? It's okay? Okay, great. Yeah, I, 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 I see my film is, is experiential and um, not a passive viewing experience, it's a active one. And um, so throughout the editing process, I always was asking people to watch and um, having discussions and, and getting feedback. Um. When I was in middle school, they would say that all of Louisiana would be underwater. There are unspoken rules about what can and can't be talked about. Climate change is off limits. I wonder why are we accepting this? Home of floods a lot. Y'all flood around here? We only had a big flood three years ago in Lafayette. 
These levees really put the river in a straitjacket. We're actively keeping the river from doing what it has always done, which is build land. There's a lot of silence around the history here. Enslaved people were forced to build levees here to protect the cane fields. There are bodies in these levees. Unfortunately, along with petrochemical industry comes hazardous emissions. My life is only worth what, a couple of barrels of oil to you? The prejudice in this area is very, to this day, it's alive and well. The more I learn about the truth, I just wish I would have learned about how everything was connected. You have to decide, how am I going to live and what is the value for my life? And what am I worth? What is my environment worth? We're trying to advocate for ourselves, knowing that this is going to impact us the most. It's our approaching future. Yeah, I, I thought it might be valuable to show a clip since I, I sort of started off this discussion with courage um, as as being with what you're afraid of and um, with the capacity to withstand, hold grief. And and I, th I mean, I, I collaborated with three really wonderful young people in my film and um, they, I thought a lot about how these young people could reach a, a broader audience, reach young other young people, and um, and through their experiences and perspectives, they can communicate. They they can they can communicate about these heavy topics in a way that um, offers an entryway for others and isn't um, isn't so he you know they kind of are like the light uh the light doorway like come in and we're gonna make this fun and um it's okay to be awkward about it and um talk about our insecurities while we're on this oil rig thinking about how uh refineries have polluted our home um so i definitely was always considering audience and thinking not thinking about the market at all <laughs> but thinking about how do how how do we receive information and um and who am i creating a story for and are they able to receive it and are they able to to follow these young women on this very active learning journey well kara that you know i'm so happy so let's talk about this a little bit you know you describe hollow tree as an experiment in documentary process as a classroom right and I, I just was fascinated by that. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that meant for you as you were working on the project and then what that has meant as you've released um, Hollow Tree into the world. Yeah, well, I wrote out a long response, but I'm not going to read my responses. <laughs> I'm gonna just wing it because <laughs> I think that's uh, perhaps better. Uh, there, I wrote a, an article in Southern Cultures, which is a peer reviewed um, academic journal that uh, is available online. So if you are inclined to, to really delve into what uh, I think filmmaking as a classroom means in relation to documentary and the climate crisis, um, that is searchable on the internet and readable. Um, filmmaking as a classroom to me is described the process of co-learning that is happening on screen where I as a director am facilitating a learning experience that the young women and their communities are fully participating in and um and through their questions about I mean the film really started uh with me asking each of these young women what do you notice in your environment um and what are your questions? And they, one of them said like, well, the place I used to go, I'm go fishing with my family. It's not there anymore. Um, I have no idea why. No one's talking about this in school. Uh, another young woman, Tanyama, described um, a flood in 2016 in Baton Rouge where the school bus persisted in driving even though the rain was heavy. And next thing you know, the water is like up to the steps in the bus and trickling in. And she's like, do you think we should stay home? Um, so these kind of pressing questions about their 
these young women, they all had beautiful questions about their environment and their, their curiosity led the process and, and I followed it. And the film really documents um, my following their questions and, and um, the hope is that the audience is also asking questions and in that the film is open to, uh, is, is an experience wherein you're learning alongside these young women. One of the things I find so extraordinary about documentaries is that there's not a formula, right? There's so many different ways that you could, so many vis different visual styles, different, um, ways in which you find like ways to come in right um and and room for experimentation that I think people don't I don't know people who are not into documentaries maybe don't understand how much room there is to you know to experiment um so I'm I'm so I have not seen a uh, hollow tree yet but I'm very excited to um to check it out um so Drew so would, oh go ahead Kira go ahead no I don't want to I, I guess I just say that the, the experiment wasn't experiment for experiment's sake it was really a reaction to um, doc the documentary field and um, the power and positionality of having a camera and, and who tends to be behind the camera and what does it mean if you're a white person with any kind of, I mean, already I have cultural capital in that and, and how do I, how do I make something how do I tell a story that's not extractive and not um, contributing to the world's demise? I don't know. Uh, so this is an attempt at that. That's, I mean, and the thing about that too is, right, so one of the things that you all talked about is that some of the stuff that we're asking people to look at is uncomfortable, right? So that sounds to me like a really brave way to, and an interesting way to find your way in, right? Here's this uncomfortable thing. Here's these young people who are going to deal with it. Let's walk this path with them. It's beautiful. Um, so, all right, speaking of different ways in, Drew, you, your early work was as a cinematographer. Um, so it was really funny to hear you talk about, um, you know, doing a documentary about whales and you, you know, of course, in your head, you just think of like this, incredible cinematography with these, you know, charismatic megafauna, as you say. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what what made you decide to take the jump into the director's chair? You know, is it specific like, OK, these are ideas that I have that I really, really want to um, explore or and then also how did does being a cinematographer having an incredible visual sense um, affect the way that you work? Um, yeah, I. I had, well, it's really hard to make a living as a director. Um, everyone wants to be a director, um, but, uh, and everyone theoretically could kind of jump in that role, but technical roles like doing sound or cinematography or, ed or editing, um, you have to like learn a bunch of stuff and like kind of be a little bit nerdy about this or that thing. So it's easier to make a living as I think in a technical role than, than in directing, um, at least that's how I found early on. So I, I kind of felt, I fell into cinematography um, because I had a student film uh, that I was directing that all the crew bailed on it for a number of reasons. And so I had to shoot it and then it turned out pretty good. And then other people started asking me shoot, to shoot their student films and it kind of, I started getting work doing it. And so for me, cinematography is, um, it's an incredible way to collaborate with other directors um, and see how other directors work and um, and keep certain um, uh, what you might call it uh, certain muscles kind of you know you fresh and like exercised by working on other people's stuff. I'm a very monogamous director. Like it takes me, I can only focus on one pro project at a time, and they so far have taken me like between four and five years each. So. Um, so there's huge gaps in, in, you know, doing certain things. So with cinematography, it keeps, it keeps things really fresh for me. It keeps, um, and also keeps connections with the filmmaking community. Like, I don't know about um, Kira and Jamie, but to me making a film, you end up creating a little village, but you're kind of, it's very insular. Like you're just kind of in your little bubble for years. Um, so it's really nice to pop out and, and 
work with other um, people. And by the way, the only reason I shoot my own stuff is because I, well, for the sensitives, I had to. Um, like that film was about people who had um, very severe, uh, mysterious sort of reactions to um, things in the environment, um, like um, chemical pesticides or um, like cell towers, and depending on the person, stuff like that. So um, I had to go through a lot of very special processes to allow to have them like allow me to be be nearby like washing my clothes a certain way and like not taking airplanes to travel so it's a lot to ask of a crew member so I can't, that was my first feature film so I had to um I had to shoot it myself I didn't really want to uh then I just got really used to it and then fathom I don't know I was on the boats that some of them are on are like the size of a couch so there's no room for like a sound person or producer and it's also kind of a lot to ask someone to camp out for you know like 30 some days without plumbing or electricity so um i don't know if i pick i don't know what the chicken and egg answer it's like maybe i pick films that require uh nobody else to be around except me or um it just so happens that um yeah i don't know how that works but that's kind of how the two have informed i don't know if i answered your question but that yeah that's kind of what my relationship with those roles have been well, what I love, uh, what I love about your answer is this thing that, you know, for those of you who are watching who are, uh, you know, budding filmmakers, one of the things you never, you don't think going in is that you're going to do a million weird j gigs and your life is going to, and your life and your career is going to go in ways you don't expect. And there are going to be opportunities that come up that you weren't expecting. Um, so I love that. I mean, that's, you know, it sounds like your life went like this <laughs> and your projects went like that. Yeah, I worked on really, really humbling stuff to like fund my first feature documentary. Like it, it wasn't like I wasn't shooting like flashy music videos, which would be super cool that I do I, some of that later on. But like it was very humbling work. Um, it's it's I won't share what shows I shot, but it was. Um, yeah, yeah, but you have to like it makes it it makes everything better. Um, it really does. I think that kind of struggle makes it all better. So speaking of winding roads, uh, Jamie, the projects you have worked on, um, they span. <laughs> you, they span uh, geography, they span topic. Um, so I'm curious, I just wanna know, I mean, how did, how, how what, how, how have you chosen the topics that you have worked on and um, what has that road been like for you? Yeah, I really love this question. Um, I think in some ways it goes back to one of my professors in film school. Um, I remember he told us um, when we were learning how to become documentary producers and directors that, you know, a good filmmaker should be able to make the ordinary extraordinary. You know, in other words, you should be able to make a topic, you should be able to make a film about any topic and make it interesting. And so I feel like I've really embraced that challenge, you know, when unique grant opportunities have come through. The, the last artifact kilogram film was a federal grant from the US government because they wanted to educate the public about this change and how we measure things. And they felt it was important for people to know and um, doing a film that could be on public television and international release was a way to engage the world and what was happening in the scientific community. Um, so some of it has just been sort of seizing opportunities and uh, embracing those challenges. And then I think other times it's really been about the relationships where um, it's been an opportunity. I've met someone interesting and just thought, wow, this person has a really interesting story to tell that I'd like to spend time with that person or collaborators, people that I really respect as filmmakers, as cinematographers have come to me and said, let's work on something together. And just the opportunity to spend my time creating something together with people that I respect and admire and often went to school with, you know, has been really beautiful. Um, so we were able to do that for Finding Traction, one of my previous projects. Um, our cinematographer on the film met Nikki Kimball, who's an ultra marathon runner in the Bozeman airport. And she started talking to him about how she was planning this expedition in Vermont to run America's oldest hiking trail. And she was gonna try and become the fastest person on the planet to like run this race. So it was like, oh, this is a cool expedition. And, um, but as we started talking to her, we realized it, the film was more than just a running film. It had to do with 
um, the limits of the human body and spirit to do incredible things and her own quest to um, uh, really fight for gender equity in sports and to talk about some of the mental health struggles that she's felt faced alongside physical struggles. And uh, it ended up being a project that um, I was able to work with um, friends of mine from film school on it to produce it and we raised the money and, and then we, we did it, you know, but it was, it was just a chance for us to work together with someone local in our community who's doing this really amazing thing. And so I think it's all been for me about seizing unique opportunities and just running with them, literally. I love that. So we have just a couple minutes left. Um, first, I want to start out by thanking the three of you so much. The, you know, the passion that is coming off of my screen uh, into this room is, it's just, it's really infectious. And I, I, I felt very uplifted and um, uh, excited about working on, I'm, I'm like reinvigorated about working on my next project having <laughs> talked to the three of you. So speaking of that, um, for our filmmakers who are, um, for, for the, the folks who are joining us who are just starting out, um, what advice do you have for them? And, and you know, sh short graduation advice, you know, what, what's, what's, the, what's the one piece of advice that you wish you had known or that you wanna leave people with to leave them feeling like they could make, make these things happen? I'll start. Surround yourself with people that have passion like these three. <laughs> I would say be curious, ask questions. I mean, it opens so many doors and possibilities. Live somewhere inexpensive. It's <laughs> a hard one to follow, uh, Kira. That's a great one. Uh, stay true to your voice. Show us how you see the world. Not everyone else's view, your view of the world. Brilliant. Well, again, thank you to our three filmmakers, Jamie, Drew, and Kira, and for your time. And for those of you watching, thank you for joining us. Bye, everyone. <laughs>